Uh, you remain standing if you're able for the reading of God's word. Be reading from Matthew, uh, chapter 26, and just reminded just uh, how honored and privileged we are to be able to remember and, and give him the praise and glory for what we're about to receive. So thank you for coming today. Matthew 26, beginning in verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and brake it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. You may be seated. We've sung the hymn, Come Lead Us to the Mount, Pastor. Praise the Lord. Well, it's already been just a, a blessing of the service and uh, communion. It's something that's uh, really, really special. And um, we're going to talk a lot about it uh, here today. Um, if you've never been a part of a communion service uh, here at Spokane Baptist Church before, um, I'm super glad that you're here. Um, we got uh, the young people in the room with us and stuff here again today. And that's, that's wonderful. We try to bring as much of the church family uh, in for this as we can. And uh, we've made a we made an effort for our homebound people to get them communion supplies at home as they're watching on the live stream and and for our children's ministry workers and stuff and so this is a it's a family meal and uh, I'll talk more about it in, in a moment um, when we get there but I but I want to say for those of you that are that are new here to Spokane Baptist Church um, or if you're new to Christianity uh, new to new to this whole Jesus thing um, communion is one of those things that is like it's expressly for uh, Christians this is it's a it's a thing that Jesus asked his followers to do. Um, and so when we get to the communion part, I'm going to, I'll say, you don't have to be a member here. If you're new and you don't know, it's, different churches have different rules for communion. The Bible doesn't give us very specific directions on it. It's the few things that it says on this, we take very, very seriously. And then the other things, we just use a lot of grace with churches do this in all kinds of different ways. And praise the Lord. I think it ought to fit um, every church's situation. For example, how often? Um, for many of our brothers and sisters that live in very persecuted parts of the world, where just the act of going to church um, makes it likely you could go to prison or be killed, <clears throat> lose your job, anything like that. Um, many of those churches, they will have communion every single Sunday they get together. And that makes sense to me. If you are facing potentially losing your life for being a Christian, you probably very much need that reminder that Jesus has already given his life for you first. Um, here in America, where we don't face those kinds of risks, um, a burden that's in my heart is that often the communion ritual is something some churches, and, and again, I'm, I'm not, I genuinely do not intend to criticize any other churches. They have reasons and it's a balancing act for why you would do one way or not the other way. But my concern is that sometimes when you do communion, especially in a place like America, every single Sunday, and it's just added on at the end of a service, that it just kind of becomes a ritual. It's a thing that, that we do before we go home, and there's not a lot, of, a lot of impact to it, not a lot of thought is given to it. And just for me, and, and the way that my life has gone and my walk with Jesus, I just, <clears throat> I don't ever want to, myself, take communion and not just be pierced <laughs> again through the heart about what it all means. And so towards that, and, and also don't want it to be like an empty ritual, which means we need to explain it. <laughs> and so to do all that just takes time. And so, so the, the, the way we feel the Lord has led us here at Spokane Baptist Church is that we'll do, we do communion twice a year on a Sunday morning, and we just spend the whole service time for it. So that's what we're going to do here today. And again, even though it is just, and another thing I have a big burden about church is that everybody feel very welcome. And hopefully you've experienced that. You see the effort that we put into, we mean it. It's not fake. 
We, we are very, very earnest that you would come and that you would feel loved and you would feel welcome. And right away, right a part of the family, there's no test you've got to pass. There's no bar you've got to clear. There's no standard you have to live up to before you are welcome and loved here. You are. I'm so glad that you're here. And so I don't like to do anything where we say, to, where we say this is only for this group. Like that kind of cuts against a little bit of broadly what we're trying to do here. But this is a Bible thing. The Bible says that this is for the followers of Jesus Christ. And we'll explain more of that in a minute. But let me say this. The good news about that is you're invited. Today could be the day. If you've been on the fence about Jesus or about this whole thing, our goal is never to exclude you from anything. My heart's desire, and we've been praying, and the pastors have been praying, and the prayer team was praying last night, praying that you would want to step across the line, that you would want to have Jesus as your savior and be a part. This is, this is a table that you're invited to. Okay. So if you've still got your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 26, uh, we just, you just stood for the reading of it. I won't ask you to stand again. I, I want to read this, just make a couple comments and we're going to pray and, and we'll move through, uh, move through this. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 26, and this is what we today call the Last Supper. It was not the last time that Jesus would, would eat and drink with his disciples, but it was the last time he would do it with them before everything changed. And so they're getting ready for Passover. Passover, if you'll recall, is going to be the following day. The Jewish day starts at sundown. So this is not Passover. This is the day of the preparation. But they're getting things ready for the Passover. Verse 26 tells us, that as they were eating, that Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. There's a a misnomer that exists out there a little bit in, in, in some Christian circles and, and other places that, <clears throat> that the, the body and the blood of Christ are somehow like present in, in the bread and, and in the wine. Today, we won't be using wine. We'll be using grape juice. <laughs> as, a, as a church family, it's, uh, we don't want to trip anybody up. Amen? You all with me on that? So we're using the fruit of the vine. We're going to use grape juice today. So don't, uh -huh, nobody panic. Okay. But Jesus, they drank, there was wine that they had at the table. So Jesus says, this bread is my body and this wine, this cup is my blood. But I want you to know that it's not really his body and it's not really his blood. And that's obvious if you just read the Bible, right? And let me give you two reasons why that's true. Number one, Jesus has not died yet. He hasn't shed his blood yet. It's impossible for it to be those things. He's sitting right there with them. The, the context, I believe, is obvious. If I, if I, on my phone here, were to pick this out and show you one of my favorite pictures from Hugo yesterday, and I'd said, this is Hugo, isn't he cute? How many of you would think Hugo's about four inches tall and two inches wide and pastor just carries him around in his pocket? Believe me, if I could, I would do that. <laughs> but when I show you this and say, this is Hugo, you understand I'm showing you a picture of Hugo. Amen. It's not confusing. <clears throat> so Jesus, as he tears the bread apart and says, this is my body, the disciples are clearly, I believe, to understand that it pictures what's about to happen to his body. As he pours the wine out of the cup, says, this is my blood, they understand that it pictures how his blood is about to be poured out. Second thing on that, just theologically very quickly, is this, that uh, the Jews are very strictly prohibited from consuming human flesh or blood of any kind, let alone human blood. Later in the Bible, so a couple of months after this happens, uh, God gives Peter, the apostle Peter, a vision and tells him to eat a bunch of bugs and unclean animals. And even though it's a, <clears throat> a vision from, angel, uh, from heaven let down by angels, and the angel says to him, eat the bugs, <clears throat> Peter, because it's Peter, praise God, goes, no way, Lord, I have never eaten anything unclean, and I'm not going to start now. That's pretty good, right? Yeah. Notice who doesn't object in this story. Peter doesn't say a thing. What's that mean? 
If Peter had thought he was eating human flesh or drinking human blood, he would have had something to say about it. Amen? Okay. Good enough. The thing I want to key in on here is the cup. For just a, just a short thought, I've shared this before, so some of you have heard that, but I'd like to share it again, if you'll bear with me. That Jesus took the cup. This cup represents Christ's approaching death. The pouring out that is about to happen. But notice that it says in verse 27 that Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks. Verse 28. This is my blood, Jesus said of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. You maybe know the rest of the story. I like to preach it every Sunday before Easter. But they leave the upper room. So it's nighttime. The sun is set. They've eaten the Last Supper. They sing. They go to the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane on the side of the mountain. And Jesus begins to pour his heart out in prayer. He has a request. Judas has left the group at this point. He has quietly slipped away before, before the Last Supper happens, in fact. Judas has quietly left the room. As Jesus goes to the mountain to pray, Judas is collecting his money and gathering the guards to come and arrest Jesus. Jesus, of course, knowing this is transpiring, is spending the night in prayer, and he has a request for his disciples. It's there in verse 38. Then he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. I mean, Jesus, I mean... We, we emphasize a lot here the divinity of Christ, and we will do it again in this message a little bit. And it is essential to understand that Jesus Christ was not just a good man and not just a good teacher and not just a prophet, that he was, in fact, God made flesh. But he was, in fact, made flesh. Jesus Christ was a man. It's a mystery. We cannot fully comprehend it. That's okay. But the sorrow of what he's about to face is overwhelming. I believe not only as a human being, although that certainly, but the weight of all sin is about to be laid on him. Every murderer, every blasphemer, every liar, everyone that's ever hurt somebody else, been proud and unkind and greedy. And the weight of it is going to be so heavy that in a thing that we also do not understand, the Bible tells us that God the Father is going to turn his back on his son. From the cross, Jesus says some of the most upsetting words in the entire Bible. Eli, Eli, lama sin bichthani. My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Do you know that as Christians, we will never, ever know what that's like. We will never know what it would be like to have God turn his back on you. He's promised he'll never leave us and never forsake us. That we will Never, ever be forsaken. And yet Jesus knows what that's like. Why? So that we don't have to. But he's facing this moment. It's coming to pass in a matter of hours. And so Jesus is exceeding sorrowful. Even unto death. He, it's so heavy He's concerned he's not going to make it all the way to the cross. And I don't believe he's like uh, changing his mind about it. He just is wondering if he's up for it in some way. 
Hard to understand. It's one of the great assurances that, frankly, that we have that the Bible is true. If the disciples had set about to try to persuade people that this human being that they really liked was God, if they made it up, this is not the way you would write about that person. So why, why are these stories about Jesus' grief and heaviness in the Bible? It's because the disciples didn't make it up. It's in here because it's what happened. It's what they observed and saw. They had the front row seat for it. And the Holy Spirit carried them along as they relayed the story to us. Jesus says, would you stay with me and watch? The watch here is a, it's like a guard. It's a vigilance. He said, would you stay and be vigilant with me? Verse 39, Jesus went a little further and he fell on his face and he prayed. And he said, oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. The, the enormity of it is pretty intense. And, and we, we talk about it some, we'll talk about it more in a moment. But for Christians, I mean, I think, I think maybe we know this, but it's like, and if you're new to Christianity, if you're new to the whole idea, it can seem, the, the, the crucifixion, the more you think about it, the weirder it is. It's like, uh, if God wants to forgive our sins, why can't he just do that? It's, it's, it seems to me that if God seeing us sinners and knowing that we need forgiveness for our sins, that God might just say, well, I forgive you. That God might just wipe our sins away and make us clean and fit for heaven. And, and, and I remember if, as a young person and, and new to Christianity thinking, why, why not do that? That seems like the obvious thing. When, when Hugo sins against me or against his mother, right? We don't, there, there's no sacrifice that has to get made. The dog is not in any danger. And, and nobody, nobody there, there, there's no blood shed in my household so that we might forgive our son. And so the question sort of naturally arises, why all this? And, and, I, and I think it's not that Jesus is uninterested in saving us. It's the mission he came for. He, he is God in the flesh. This is, in, in, in very fullness of true sense, this is his plan. The Bible tells us that Christ is crucified from the foundation of the world. When God was creating this planet, he understood what it was going to cost him. This was always part of the plan. But here, facing the enormity of it, we get a little bit of a window into how terrifying the price is just in the reaction that Jesus has to it. And the answer to the question, by the way, is that sin is far, far, far more awful than we tend to be serious with. When it splashes out in big ways, people murdering each other, for property or land or power, we, we get it a little. When people hurt kids and rob already poor people and, and they do it just to add another coin onto the massive pile already accumulated, we, we, we start to get a sense of it a little bit. But when we look at the cross, we understand really how incredibly ugly sin is. You and I hate it when people get away with stuff, don't we? Like especially the really ugly stuff. Doesn't it grate on you? When people not only, when they, not only they escape punishment for their wrongdoing, but they prosper from it even. Not only do they not suffer, but it actually helps them. Oh, frosted every time I see it happens. We live in a world with very little justice. Very little is fair here. And that cry in your heart for fairness, for justice, 
is a reflection of the divine character of God who is just and fair. And he cannot abide the permanent injustice that unrolls all around us. He must act to restore justice. And he will. People say, God, why don't you punish the evildoers? But the people that say that do not include themselves in the camp of evildoers. If they did, they would not be clamoring quite so loudly for God to mete out justice. But once you understand that we are all in terrible danger, if God were to really hand out actual justice, God's long suffering becomes more apparent for what it is. Patience. He's giving us the opportunity to get right before it's too late. But here we see the awful cost of it. And Jesus passes a test in a garden that our great, great ancestor Adam failed. It was in a garden where Adam said, God, not your will, mine. And he did it his way instead of God's way. And all of his great, great grandchildren, you and me, have been going, choosing ourselves over God ever since. We put ourselves first. We do what we want. We follow our priorities most of the time. But Jesus, here in a garden called Gethsemane, (laughs) faced with the most awful burden anyone has ever faced, doesn't say my will. He says thine. This cup that Jesus has asked, he said, let this cup pass from me. It's like, Father, are we sure there's not another way? Are we sure there's not another way? And there's not. But Jesus gave thanks for that cup. Remember the disciples? Just an hour or two before this, he took the cup, knowing what it represented, and gave thanks for it. And now he's saying, are you sure? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this portion of scripture. We thank you for these next moments we have together. God, I pray that you would work in every heart, including mine. Help us. Help us in these moments. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. A few quick thoughts. If you'd like to follow along in your bulletin, fill a couple of blanks in there. Um, We'll fill those in as we go along. Or, of course, you're welcome to just listen. Why? I want to ask this question just quickly. Why did Jesus give thanks for this cup? Why would he give thanks for it? This is the cup, as I said a moment ago, that he prayed to pass from him, is in fact the cup that he gave thanks for. When I first was intrigued by this idea, I I often will go and look at the Greek or the Hebrew and try to make sure that I'm not missing something obvious here, but but there's not in this case. It's exactly what you'd expect. The the word when the Bible tells us that Jesus gave thanks for the cup, uh, in the Greek it's eucharisto, and it means to be grateful to feel thankful, to give thanks. It's exactly the word that you would use when you say, thank you, God, for this food, or thank you, God, for my new job, or for my kids, or anything that, any blessing in your life that you might give thanks or feel thankful about, that's the word that Jesus used about the cup. It's an active expression of gratitude. And I want you to note that nothing has changed from the Last Supper to the Garden. This is all part of God's plan of redemption. And Jesus giving thanks for this cup poses a powerful question to me, to each of us. And the question goes like this. Am I thankful for all that God does? Or am I just thankful for the easy things and for the comfortable things? We've had a lot of preaching the last few Sundays on thankfulness and you know that it's something that's especially dear to my heart. 
But one of the things that the Lord has continued to labor in my heart about is this. Um, sometimes people are not grateful even for the good things. And that's a real bummer. When we lose sight of all the good things in our life, I mean, when was the last time you thanked God that you got a warm house and that you, that you have a vehicle that runs, even if you had to borrow it, right? Thankful that you have, you don't have to sit on the floor at church. When was the last time? I was challenged once, what if this morning you'd woken up only with the things that you thanked God for yesterday? Amen. Right? But those are the good things, and, and we need to grow, don't we? And me too, we need to grow in being thankful for the good things in our life. And I would encourage you to labor at that. But once you get better at that, you're not done. Are we thankful for everything that God does? I've got a list of things I'm thankful for. They're powerful and helpful. There are many things that I've prayed for. But on my thankfulness list, I noticed there was nothing on my thankfulness list that were things I'd asked God to remove from my life. If I'm praying for God to remove it, I am not then, on the other hand, giving him thanks for giving it. Because I'm not a crazy person. You're like, wait a minute, he's about to advocate being crazy. Yes, I am. I mean, right? I mean, let's not miss what's going on here with Jesus. He, he's praying for God to remove the cup. And he is giving thanks to God for it. What's happening? I've noticed this. That the work that God wants to do is often very difficult and very hard. The work that God wants to do in our lives sometimes feels like death. It can sometimes involve death. And yet, all that God does is good. There's a lot of hard things in my life, and I know in yours too. Many of you are on my prayer lists. And so the Bible affirms over and over emphatically that everything that God does is good, that he is good and that he does good. How do we square that up with all the hard things in life? And the answer is that we must understand that good is not a synonym for easy. Everything that God does, the Bible says, is good. The Bible does not say that everything that God does is easy. I've noticed this. Many of the things that are on my thankfulness lists are things that came at the end of some of the hardest chapters in my life the worst, hardest periods in my life, at the end of them, like jewels, yep. Amen. are some of the things in my life that I treasure the most. The things that I am most deeply grateful for. But they came at the end of a very hard road. But I believe that without that difficult road to get there, I would have never had it. I think about my daughter. I think about the revival that God sent to my marriage after years of growing apart. I think about God sparing my dad's life from the sepsis. I think about the things that I tell myself when I'm scared or worried or overwhelmed. These things that I'm, these big, grateful, powerful moments in my life but they came after scary, hard things, some of them for years and years and years. Everything God does is good. It's not always easy. And Jesus, in fact, is our great example of the joy that waits at the end. And Jesus, knowing the joy that waited at the end, was able to give thanks even for a thing you really wished he didn't have to do. God is building in this in my heart about dealing with my daughter and dealing with Heather's cancer and, and saying, you know what? I'm going to choose to be grateful. I'm going to try to be grateful even now while it's still hard and while I'm still praying for it to go away, frankly. And you should pray for it to go away too. If you love your pastor, you just pray. 
But that doesn't mean we can't be thankful for it. Jesus was. Hebrews 12 is in your bulletin. and It says, let us run with patience the race that's set before us, looking unto the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God for the joy that was set before him. So, why did Jesus give thanks for the cup? I love this painting. I'm not not sure, I'm genuinely unsure who painted it. It's called First Day in Heaven. And, uh, I don't envision myself with that long a hair, but uh, <laughs> you all can have your turn hugging Jesus when I'm done. Just wait your turn. And I, and I, I often think about how much I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus. And, uh, and seeing Evangeline there. And some of my dear, dear friends from this church and my family that are waiting. But something that we maybe don't always think about as much is the joy on Jesus' end of it. As, as another one comes in, that he endured the cross for, that he despised the shame for, that he bought with his own blood. And when you step across the finish line, after all that Jesus invested into you to get you there, what do you think his reaction is going to be? To seeing his kid make it home safe and sound. That's pretty good, isn't it? And the Bible tells us that that is what empowered Jesus. That's what encouraged him through this darkest chapter of his life. Even as he is sorrowful unto death, so heavy with grief that he's unsure if his body can handle it. And he thought about you. He thought about you. And he was willing to pay the price so that you can come home. Joy on both sides. So why did Jesus give thanks for the cup? He gave the thanks for the most difficult and painful thing in his life because of the joy of being a part of the divine plan. Which leads us to a question that we want to ask ourselves. Why should we give thanks for the cup? In light of that, it seems probably pretty straightforward, but I want to share a couple thoughts with you about it. First of all, number one, this cup, is a cup of genuine fellowship. It's a cup of true fellowship. You ever had fake friends? <laughs> you ever had people that, maybe family members even, people that you thought, hey, I'm going to count on them, we're going to stick together, we're going to do it, and then you found out that was just on your side and not on theirs? And it stings, doesn't it? Hurts a lot. But here at the cup, At the Lord's table, we find a cup that represents the death of Christ on our behalf, but it represents genuine, true, sacrificial fellowship. A real friend, real family. Jesus says he took the, in verse 27, it says he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them. This wasn't just about Jesus. He was including them in it. They were to be participants. Now he's the one that's going to die He's the one that's going to pay the price. He's the one that's going to finally triumph where Adam failed. But they are invited to partake. That's pretty cool. I love what John 13, 1 says in your outline. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, he should depart out of the world unto the Father. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. You mean even when they fell asleep when all he'd asked them to do was stay awake and pray. Yeah, he still loved them. Even when they ran away. Yeah. Even when they denied that they even knew him. Yeah. Even when they abandoned him 
to only his mother and John at the foot of the cross? Yeah. Jesus loved them, and despite all their failings and shortcomings, he loved them right to the very end. It didn't change how he felt about them. How good to have a friend that even when you're messing up pretty bad, it doesn't change the way they feel about you. You have that friend in Jesus. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Once you come to Jesus, the Bible says that we are spiritually placed into Christ. You cannot be any safer. You cannot be any safer than when you are in Christ because you're in Christ. And he can't deny you any more than he can deny himself. You are adopted into him. Which is why we know Hebrews 13, 5, he, Jesus says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You say, but pastor, I've messed up so bad. Okay. Jesus knows. And you're still invited. We ought to give thanks for this cup, not only because it's a cup of fellowship and we're invited in, but it's a cup of very costly forgiveness. Jesus said in verse 28, this is my blood the New Testament that is shed for many for the remission of sins. Remission is a pardon, a release. It means there's no more penalty. It is the price that is required for divine forgiveness. Why? Because remission, remission is what's in view. It's not just a matter of forgiveness, of let's let bygones be bygones. The problem is hurt has been caused. Damage has been done. There's a debt that is owed. And if we just say, I forgive the debt, then somebody's left holding the bag. Somebody doesn't get paid, right? It's not justice. It's merciful. It's fun for the person that got forgiven, but for the person who was wronged and it was never made right, it's deeply unfair. At some point, it's got to be made fair. At some point, the scales have got to be balanced again. And I'll ask you a question. How do you balance the scales for a family that's had to bury one of their kids because somebody wanted their sneakers and killed them to get it? How do you balance the scales for the, for the young woman whose life is destroyed because of the rapaciousness of some wicked men? How do you balance the scales of war and violence? Is it even possible to balance those scales again? To set it right for the people who have been so incredibly wronged? What can wash away my sins? I'll tell you, there's nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is no valuable commodity in the world that is sufficiently valuable to right the scales of injustice in the world. There's just one thing, and it's the blood of Jesus Christ. If you want remission, if you want the things to be actually set right so that you don't just sneak into heaven, but you've been made fit for it, there's only one thing that can do it. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ. Leviticus 17, 11, The life of the flesh is in the blood. I have given you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. There has never ever been release from guilt without the shedding of the life. It costs life. Hebrews 9.22, almost all things by the law are purged with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. The scales cannot be balanced unless there's a life debt paid. Hebrews 10.17, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Because where the remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. If the remission is accomplished, if the scales are balanced, if the debt is actually paid... 
You're free indeed. There's no lingering debt anymore because it's actually been satisfied. But what can actually satisfy? What can actually make it right? Is there anything that can undo a lie? Is there anything that can unwind the hurt and the wrong that's been caused? There is something, but there's only one something, and it's the blood of Jesus Christ. And without his blood, you cannot set it right. Oh, somebody might forgive you and they might let you go along your way, but the wrong was still done. The hurt is still there. There's only one thing that can unmake the hurt. There's only one thing that can put it right again. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ or nothing. I'm telling you, if you want to be actually right, if we want it to be actually level and straight again, only Jesus can do it. And it cost him his life to do it. There was no other way. If there was another way, Jesus would have taken it. Do you know how much it cost to not just forgive you, but to undo all the things that we've done wrong? All the times we've been greedy, all the times, I mean, for those people, it's hard enough, but even take it to yourself. All the times I've been greedy, all the times I've been selfish, all the times I picked myself over my wife, all the times I picked myself over my kids. All the times I shaded the truth a little bit. I don't tell lies. I just shaded the truth a little bit to make myself look better, save myself some embarrassment. All the things I've put people through through the years. What could ever make it right? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But I want you to see number three that it's a cup of wonderful promise. Boy, it's a, co- it's, it's a cup of costly forgiveness, but it's also a cup that's filled with wonderful promise. Jesus said, I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Today, when we drink this cup and we remember the heavy part is looking back to how much it cost Jesus to forgive us. But the exciting part is that Jesus said, we're going to do this again, but the next time we do it, it's going to be in the kingdom. When we, when we sit down at that cup, all our sins are washed away, buried in the sea of God's forgetfulness. In heaven, you'll never say to God, by the way, Lord, I'm sorry about that time I did the thing. Because even if you tried, the answer is going to be, I don't know what you're talking about. Gone. Removed as far as the east is from the west, the Bible says. And so, and what a joy. What a joy. And it's not just, sometimes when we've been forgiven, you you have that lingering little bit of guilt, right? Even when somebody forgives you, why? Because you know you messed up. You know you've wronged them. You know even if they've forgiven you, it's not really been set right. But not in the kingdom. It will have been set right. The scales will have been balanced. There will be no more guilt because it's been paid for. It's been done, finished, put away. Ho, 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 ho. Can you imagine being able to just rejoice in the presence of God and the presence of your friends? None of them are sinners anymore and neither are you. And any of the little things we've done wrong to each other, all handled, all handled. I mean, what a day that's going to be. And Jesus is going to be there. And we're going to drink this cup again, and it's going to take on a whole brand new light. But we look forward to that with anticipation. John 14, Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. This was the one that turned me around when I was, when my faith was collapsing into ash. Is these words from Jesus. Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and I'll receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. I'll tell you, just like you, I have doubts and fears and sometimes I, I wonder about things. I mean, things I believe even, things I believe. Uh, some of these things I believe strong enough, I die for them. I'm not recanting. I believe it that strongly. But that doesn't mean that sometimes I don't go, is it really true? Have I kidded myself? Do I believe these things just because I really want to? And I'll tell you the rock, the anchor for me in that is that I know Jesus. I do. I mean, I've read so much about him and he's walked with me. I just, I know what he's like. 
And Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you can be. And I do not believe that Jesus would have lied about that. There's no, it's inconceivable to me that Jesus would say that if it weren't true. And so I believe him. I believe him. And so I am filled with hope about what lies on the other side of death. Because I believe that Jesus tells the truth. And I'm looking forward to seeing him there. Now, when we take communion here in a few moments, I'm going to remind you again that this is an observation that's just for Christians, for those that are trusting Jesus Christ as their Savior. I'd like to say again how urgently it is my desire the church be a welcoming place for everybody, and I do not like to do anything that would make someone feel excluded. But Jesus left this observation for his followers. It's kind of a family meal. It's kind of a family reunion. But there is very good news. There is a seat at this table for you. He died on a cross so that he could adopt you into his family. If you are not sure, if you are not sure that you've been born again into Jesus' family, I would like to right now very simply share this gospel message with you about how you can be saved, about how you can claim your seat at this table. This is not an exclusive club. We very much want you to be a part of it. Here's the gospel message. Quite simply, it goes like this. Number one, we've all broken God's laws. The message starts, unfortunately, with some bad news, and it requires some humility. Most people admit they're not perfect. That's good news. If you think you're perfect, we'll check with your friends. The Bible says it real simply, Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's just no wiggle room in that. In fact, 1 John says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. It's unwise to claim that you're not a sinner. The Bible says we all are. And the Bible says the only person you could fool into thinking you're not a sinner is yourself. No one else will believe that. And, the, and the, the problem here is not just that we're not perfect. It's what does perfect mean? The people throw that word around perfect. Like in, in today's culture, people have lost the sight of, well, what is the standard? Who decides what perfect is? Who decides what's right and wrong? And the answer to that is God. It's not just that we're not the people we want to be, which we're not. It's not just that we're not the people we would like to be, which we're not. I mean, people fail their own standards. Amen. I fail my own standards all the time. I, I'm not the husband I would like to be. I am not the father I would like to be. I am not the pastor I would like to be. I am not the friend I would like to be. By my own standards, I come up very short. But my standard, who cares? Or your standard, who cares? No offense. What's God's standard? And God's standards are very high. They're perfect. And none of us live up to that. Not, not one. It gets worse because the second part of the gospel is that the just, the fair, the righteous penalty for sin is, in fact, death. We saw that when we looked at those verses a few moments ago. If we use our lives to rebel against the one who gave us that life, to choose ourselves over him, the fair consequence for that is that you do not get to have life anymore. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. A wage is what you earn. It's what's fair and right. If you worked all week, you worked all month and did not get paid at the end, you would be unhappy. It would be unfair for your employer to not give you what they owed you. God will not be unfair. Unfortunately, what we are earning with our sin is death. Wherefore, Romans 5 says, By one man sin entered into the world, and death entered by sin. So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Everywhere you find death, you find the working of sin. Even in animals. Animals don't sin themselves, but they suffer from the consequences of sin, don't they? Young children, the consequences of sin everywhere is death. Whether ours or sinners around us. Revelation 21 
makes it very clear that this sin, a cycle of sin and death will not be allowed into heaven. And praise God, it wouldn't be heaven anymore if it was, right? I mean, if God allowed us to go into heaven, still sinners, still willing to choose ourselves over him, guess what? That's already happened. That's the Garden of Eden, basically. We, we will do to heaven exactly what we have done to earth if something radical is not changed first. Revelation 21, there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh an abomination or maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. You, you're going to have to escape what we are. And how do we do that? Finally, there's good news. Jesus paid that price for you. We say the, the, the punishment's death, and it is. But Jesus paid it for you. Now, if Jesus was just a man, at best, he could do a one-to-one -one trade. And our odds are not good. If Jesus was just a good teacher, if he was just a prophet, one life for one life is the best you could hope for. But because Jesus was God in the flesh, because Jesus is the infinite one, he was able to make an infinite payment. God commends, his, Romans 5, 8 tells us, God commends his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus didn't die for the good people. <laughs> Couldn't find any. He didn't die for those that had their lives all together and that were doing pretty good already. And he said, oh, that guy just needs a little help across the finish line. No. While we're still enemies of his, while we're still running away from him, while we're still doing the wrong things, Jesus loved you before you ever thought to love him back and died for you. Romans 3 says, declare at this time, I say his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. God is able to be fair because the price is actually paid and merciful because you don't have to be the one to pay it. But that doesn't mean everyone's going to go to heaven. The Garden of Eden was not a prison. Adam and Eve were allowed to leave. It's a tragedy that they chose to do it. You will not be forced into heaven either. God will, in fact, respect your decision on this matter. And you're going to have to make a personal choice. You want to do it your way? My will be done? Or do you want to say, Jesus, I'm doomed without you? Instead of wanting salvation on your terms, you'll take it on Christ's. You get to decide. Romans 10 says that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Saved from sin, saved from death, saved from hell. You can be saved, saved, saved. And all you got to do is choose him. It's got to be genuine, of course. But all you got to do is choose him. Notice it doesn't say whoever is saved and makes it to church at least two Sundays a month. Whoever receives Christ and tells half as many lies as they used to tell? Right? No. If you will genuinely receive Christ, if it's a genuine thing, you believe that he was who he says he was. The Lord Jesus Christ. Not just a man, not just a prophet, the Lord. You believe that he is the Lord. You believe that he died on an old rugged cross for you. You believe that he rose from the dead. You believe he really walked out of that tomb three days later, rolled the stone aside, and walked out. You say, you know what? That's crazy, but I believe it. I know that's not how things normally work, but I believe it. If you could really believe that about Jesus, you believe he was the Lord, you believe that he died for you, you believe that he rose again, and you say, Jesus, I want you. Saved. Saved, the Bible says. Listen, if you've never taken Jesus up on this offer, 
please do it today. If it matters, I would beg you to do it. We're going to have a, some singing and some time of quietness in just a moment. Um, I encourage, if you're, if you're thinking about making a decision for Christ, to come talk to a pastor. Let us go through the Bible verses with you face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball. Make sure that it's all understood. We get all your questions answered. But you could do this in the quietness of your own heart right here. Really, this is a deal between you and Jesus. Final note, and then I'm going to ask Stan to come and sing. I know I've spent a lot of time on this. I regret nothing. Before Stan comes and sings, before we take the communion, I want to say very quickly a few things about how wonderful Jesus is. I want to remind you that our Savior made an infinite payment. How wonderful is it that Jesus didn't make a down payment on salvation? That Jesus is not the quarterback and that he throws you the football of salvation and says, end zones that way, good luck. (laughs) Right? I mean, how rough would that be? I'm telling you, Jesus won the whole game and has been carried out of the stadium on the shoulders. It's all over. He won. He paid it all. And you're invited to join his team still. Even though the game's over, Jesus says you can join. He made an infinite payment because he, in fact, is God. The Bible says in Colossians 2, 9, For in him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Otherwise, there is no hope for us. Secondly, Jesus made a fitting payment. Even though he is God, even though he is the infinite creator God, he became a person so that the payment would be fitting. So that it would be a human paying the price for humans. And it's a mind-numbing thing. We'll talk more about it at Christmas. (laughs) But what a crazy thing that the eternal God would love us. See, I, to me, it's obvious that there is a God. We've talked about this some. But here's the thing. When we built this building, you know what we didn't do? We didn't care about the ants that lived in the dirt under the building. We didn't hate them. We weren't mad at them. We just wanted to build a building. And we just brought the bulldozers in one day and just wiped thousands of them out. And it would have been very hard to explain to the ants what they did wrong or why we were so mad at them. Or why would you do this to us? And like, it would be hard to explain the reason to them, right? Now, here's the question. You're like, what's going on? Let me tell you. How big do you think the gap in intelligence and wisdom and power between you and an ant is? It's quite far, isn't it? How big is the gap in wisdom and power and intelligence between you and God? I don't think it's at all obvious that God would care at all what happens to creatures crawling around on a little speck of dust orbiting a star somewhere in the galaxy. Why should God care? Is it Does he owe that to us? Personally, I find that I would want some persuasion that a being as great as the eternal creator God is actually interested in Josh Tucker. And so God left his throne and traded it in for a manger in Bethlehem. Whoa. Why? So that you and I could be confident that he does care. That he does know. And that he is close. Jesus then made a very merciful payment. Because he died for sinners. Because knowing all, I mean, we hide things from other people about ourselves, don't we? We don't really want everybody to know everything about us because you frankly can't trust people with that kind of information. Right? One of the signs of how close you are to somebody is how much they know about you. The more they know about you, the more you know about them, the closer you are. The less they know about you and the less you know about them, the further apart you are. Because you become vulnerable as people learn more things about you. When they see you at your worst, when they see you when you're caught off guard, when they... Smell how your breath smells in the morning. 
They have access to information about you that we brush our teeth very vigorously to hide that information from others. <laughs> Did you know that Jesus knows everything about you? Every thought you've ever had, every word you've ever said. And he loved you enough to die for you anyway. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. For it's a complete payment because he paid the debt in full. The payment's not only infinite in its scope, it's complete in its depth. Jesus, when he died on the cross, his last words, John 19, 30 said, it is finished. Not started, <laughs> finished. Hebrews 10, their sins and iniquities I will remember no more because where the remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness <clears throat> to enter the holiest place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way that he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say through his flesh, you can go close to God now because Jesus did it top to bottom. And lastly, I just want to reiterate again that this is an available payment. It's available right now. There's no waiting period. No hoops to jump through. No punches to get in your Christian punch card before you can get saved. Jesus said, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest.